I was just talking about how the um, the book of numbers is called numbers because it talks about two population counts one done at the beginning uh, when god is counting the number of people to find out who would be uh, the soldiers uh, who would be able to go and fight when they enter the promised land the second numbering the second population count is done at the end uh, to count the new generation which would be entering the promised land uh, yeah coming to the structure of the book of numbers uh, we see that uh, the chapters 1 to 9 talk about how they are getting ready to enter the promised land they're making all the preparations the number of soldiers is counted all of that is done because god is getting them ready to enter inside um, and um, uh, we also another significant thing that we see in chapters 1 to 9 uh, it's basically where the second Passover celebration takes place in the first Passover that is when God delivers them out of Egypt and so now one year has passed and now they are celebrating the second Passover uh, so these things are recorded in chapters 1 to 9 and then uh, in chapters 10 to 12 is where you have the people complaining against the Lord and uh, the Lord um, gives them the meat which they want but he also punishes them because of their greed. Um, we also have this incident about Miriam and Aaron in chapters 10 to 12, where Miriam and Aaron feel that they are being sidelined. They're not being given enough importance as leaders, that Moses is getting all the credit. And so they try to push themselves forward, uh, you know, and then they complain against Moses and the Lord is not at all pleased. So it would be wiser down the line for all of us to stick to whatever role God has assigned us to rather than coveting someone else's position. Uh, so uh, the Lord, you know, he backs up Moses and he says uh, that what you two have been doing in your attitude towards him has been wrong. Then uh, in chapters 13 to 19 is where you have the 12 spies being given, uh, being being sent to you know look at the uh, promised land and of course we know 10 of them come back with a negative report it's only two of them who trust god and say no this is possible god will help us and uh, because the people um, they grumble against the lord and they refuse to enter saying that our children will be destroyed and all of that because of that um, god decides that he would punish them and that they would stay 40 years in the wilderness uh, chapters 20 to 36 would be the last section. Here, you uh, one important thing that we see is um, the prophet Balaam, who is hired by the king Balak to bring a curse upon the Israelites. Even though he tries his very best to curse them, the only messages which are coming into his mind are positive messages of blessing regarding what God is going to do for the uh, Israelites. So even though he tries very hard, he is unable to uh, curse them. And so uh, he comes up with another method of how he can turn the people away from God so that God's protection will no longer be uh, upon them. So uh, he is the one who gives advice to King Balak saying, it is true that all my prophecies were positive, but there is a way that we can make these Israelites turn away from God so that they can lose God's protection. And so he um, um, gives Balak the idea of introducing you know, sexual immorality where these uh, Israelites, if they start uh, you know, mingling with the local people, then their purity and their holiness would be completely distracted. And uh, so uh, we see all of that explained in this last section. Mm. We also, of course, see how Joshua is now is made the new leader. So he is commissioned by Moses to take over. So these are some, these are some of the main things that we see in this book of Numbers. Uh, now, how is Christ represented in the book of Numbers? We have many examples. Uh, in Numbers 19, it talks about a red heifer. And that is supposed to be a representation of Jesus Christ. What on earth is a red heifer? Uh, that's just basically a cow, which is still young and has not yet given birth to any calves. Okay, so that would be a heifer. 
So uh, the sacrifice of the heifer, which is mentioned in Numbers 19, um, that is a representation of the sacrifice which Christ will, will do later. Why do they call it a red heifer? That's just because of the uh, reddish brown hair, that okay, reddish brown fur, which that particular kind of cow would have had. Um, the next representation of Jesus Christ in this book would be uh, the rock from which the people drink. Uh, and that is talked about in 1 Corinthians 10, 4. And so if we can have someone read out 1 Corinthians 10, 4, then we will see in what way um, Jesus is being cast as the type of this rock. Yes. Okay, so um, we have a um, story in the book of Numbers which talks about how water comes from the rock and the people's thirst is quenched and that particular rock is compared to Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And there's something very interesting that it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 4. It says, uh, they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them. Their complaint was that God was not paying them attention. God was not providing for their needs. He was not giving them the water which they require. That was all their grumbling was all about. But the point is that the spiritual rock, Jesus Christ, was there with them throughout that journey. He never let, left them for even a day. It's just that he was um, not physically visible. They could not see him. And so they chose not to believe in him. But the point is, when the time came, he would have provided them with the water if they had just waited patiently. Do you think Moses was not feeling thirsty? Aaron was not feeling thirsty? They too were thirsty. But they knew that when the right time comes, their spiritual rock will provide them with the water they require. But the people grumbled against the Lord. And uh, um, uh, so over here, the rock is being compared to Jesus who can quench our thirst. And um, oh, we have uh, the daily manna that also is presented uh, as a picture of Jesus Christ. We see that in John chapter 6, verses 31 to 33. In John 6, 31 to 33, it talks about the bread of life, Jesus being the bread of life. And he is referred to as the mana, the bread of life. So again, there is a connection between the book of Numbers and, um, uh, and the New Testament. And uh, there's one very interesting uh, thing that Balaam says in his prophecy about the future Christ. That we would find in uh, chapter 24, verse 17. Uh, if someone could read out that for us, please. Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. Yeah. So over here, it talks about how a star shall come forth. Okay, so we have a prophecy about uh, Jesus Christ being given by this Balaam, who did not even, first of all, want to speak blessings upon the nation of Israel, but God forced him to speak out the truth. Um, and then, of course, one of the main uh, you know, um, representations of Christ in the book of Numbers is the bronze serpent, which was placed on a pole. Uh, when the people were being judged and punished. Uh, so maybe we could uh, talk a little bit about that because in uh, John chapter 3, Jesus compares himself to that uh, bronze serpent which has been you know, um, kept on a pole. Now that incident, that event is covered in Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 to 9. So if we were to go to Numbers 21, 4 to 9, over there we see how the people were uh, grumbling and they were not satisfied with what God had provided. And uh, in Numbers 21, uh, I think it is in verse 5, 
they say something really terrible they say there is no bread there is no water and we detest this miserable food imagine a food which is being miraculously given to them it's dropping down literally from heaven every day and they're saying we detest this miserable food uh, that shows the level of their gratitude okay they didn't even care that out in the wilderness where there are no shops where you cannot grow crops in a place like that god is providing food to thousands of people and they all they can say about that is oh this food is miserable and so uh, we see uh, god bringing judgment upon them there are poisonous snakes which come into the camping area where they are camped and uh, many of them start dying uh, so that is when the lord says um, you know yeah moses is the one who cries out and he says lord please you know uh, the, we have sinned against you so spare us and then the lord says in verse 8 make a snake and put it up on a pole anyone who is bitten can look at it and live okay so um jesus compares himself to this particular uh, incident and he says in the same way the bronze serpent was lifted up in the wilderness i too the son of man will also be lifted up uh, and uh, so some people are very unhappy with this they say why would jesus go and compare himself to a snake he could have compared himself to so many more pleasant things so why this particular imagery and um, uh, one thing that we would need to understand is that uh, the israelites for them in numbers 21 the particular symbol which was used of the bronze serpent would have made a lot of sense okay based on their culture based on their background it would have made sense to them what yahweh is trying to convey what is he trying to convey by putting up that kind of a, a serpent um, you know image on a pole because we looked i think in one of the previous classes at joshua chapter 24 verse 14 where we read that these people had even forgotten who their god is and they were worshiping the gods of the egyptians so that was the culture which was which has which, which was filling up their minds and part of that culture included something um, uh, you know that was called i can't remember the name of it but yeah it was one of the snake gods of the egyptians if you look at any clip art of um, the pharaoh if you look at any paintings of pharaoh you would always see him wearing that crown and you have that little snake sticking out you know there from the, from the center of his forehead now that was called the urius serpent uh, that basically was the serpent which represented royalty it also represented divine protection the idea was that as long as the king is wearing that he will be guarded and protected from all harm and danger and also if he becomes sick he would receive healing because of the protection of the urius serpent which is supposed to be looking after him okay so um so it was significant this particular thing was significant which is why when god sends aaron and moses to talk to pharaoh to you know the in the very first uh, interaction which they have at that time itself god is trying to show pharaoh that he is all powerful and so the sign which is given to perform over there uh, the lord instructs throw down your wooden staff and it will turn into not a rabbit you know not a pigeon it's going to turn into a snake there was a very specific reason why god used that imagery and then we know what happens all the other magicians say no props even we can produce snakes so they all throw, throw down their wooden staffs and that also turns into a bunch of snakes but that is where god points out who he is his wooden staff the snake which he has um, made you know that is able to swallow up all of the other uh, snakes so god was establishing very clearly that he is superior to these powers Uh, that they think are supposed to be great but he is proving that he is the living god and so now here the people are out in the wilderness and they are being judged for the way they have uh, rebelled against god and shown no gratitude whatsoever and so the lord has now uh, brought poisonous snakes and they are getting bitten and 
if they are looking and waiting and you know hoping that the gods of the egyptians are going to come and rescue them that is not going to happen god specifically says to them you create a bronze serpent put it up on a pole and anyone who looks upon it they will be healed god is trying to say you people think that the egyptian gods are so great you are longing to go back over there but those gods and that land has no power they it, it, it can offer you nothing on the other hand if you look to me i can offer healing and uh, so the bronze serpent is basically um, showing the superiority of yahweh compared to all the other serpent gods of egypt so in the same way the wooden staff st staff of aaron was superior to the other wooden staffs in the same way this bronze serpent that god has asked uh, moses to mold is superior to the other snake gods which were supposed to be you know gods of healing but they could do nothing it was yahweh who healed and we were discussing this in uh, the john chapter 3 class you know which i had with the uh, john students and uh, there was one question which one person uh, brought up which i felt was quite relevant he said when the people went over there to look at that bronze serpent maybe it reminded them of the egyptian gods so maybe they were looking to the egyptian gods for the, for their healing and not really to yahweh and uh, i think that is a valid point but you see Mo, uh, moses would have explained why he is making a uh, bronze serpent it would have taken him at least 2 hours to you know mold a, you know he didn't exactly have a bronze serpent sitting in his bag right he had to literally make it so it would take some time to mold it and then that thing has to cool down and once it cools down into you know a cold metal then you're going to stick it up on a pole all that process will at least take two uh, two hours or maybe even more uh, so during that time moses would have explained to the people the significance of what he is doing he is putting up the serpent to show them you know what you think that serpents are great the healers the protectors yahweh is greater he can do what no, i mean no other power can do so um to use a very weak example a very silly example but it gets the message across it's like as if god is saying okay are you people worshipers of bullocks you know what i am a more superior bullock and a greater ultimate uh, power than any of these bullocks are you people worshipers of um, goats you know what i am a greater goat the ultimate goat no one can compare with me so over here the imagery of the serpent is being used simply to point out that these gods have no power i am the ultimate you know i am uh, so when these people were asked to go over there in the book of numbers you know um, and look upon that bronze serpent it would have taken little amount of effort and a little amount of faith because you see you're bitten you're not exactly in a position to you know go trotting off to wherever the pole has been put up you you're literally dragging yourself over there you're in pain you are dying you're in the process of dying and now you need to go over there to wherever maybe it was in the middle of the camp you know where that thing had been put up so they would have to drag themselves over there and look upon it so they would need to exercise some faith should we really go over there will it have any effect how on earth will looking at a bronze statue you know change anything in any way so they would have to think they would have to exercise their faith and they would actually have to go over there and there might have been some people who would have said where is the point i'm almost dying anyway no pointing in you know in going and looking at a statue and they would have chosen not to go and look at it so in the same way jesus in the new testament he is saying the son of man will be lifted up but who would be willing to trust in him there will be people who will say oh yes this is the true messiah and i will put my faith in him but others will say no 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 this is he's not the right one and they would continue looking for other messiahs they would continue waiting for other saviors so there's great significance in the uh, you know the comparison which jesus draws he says the son of man will be lifted up just like that snake was and who is willing who is ready to trust in him and make a commitment to him okay so that's the comparison uh, that we see over here um and um what else can we look at from the book of numbers um the levites okay the levites in numbers chapter 1 verses 45 to 50 it talks about 
uh, why the Levites were separated and dedicated to the Lord. Hmm. In Numbers chapter 1, verse 45, it says, It says, count all the people who can serve in the army, you know, people who are 20 years and above, count them so that they can serve in the army, so that they can participate in battle you know, whenever uh, the people have to defend themselves. These people who are above the age of 20, all the men, they would have to be part of the army. But then this instruction is given in verse 46. The Levites, however, uh, were not counted along with the others. Why? Because the Lord very specifically says in verse 50, their responsibility is different. They are supposed to uh, be in charge of the tabernacle. So they have other priestly duties to take care of. So the Levites will not form part of the army. Their job will be exclusively attending to the tabernacle, helping out with the sacrifices, taking care of the you know spiritual mentoring of the people. That would be their responsibility. And um, I seem to have got my notes mixed up a little bit. Um, yeah. Um, so usually the priests would not do any fighting. But we see in one of the two, three examples of battles which are mentioned in the Old Testament, the priests would go into the battlefield with the soldiers, not to fight, but be over there in the battlefield as God's representatives. So uh, we see that even in uh, you know the Chronicles chapter 20 passage, where it is the priests who lead the army into battle with singing and praise. So always the priests would go into the battle as a representation of God, but they would not necessarily, you know, uh, be involved in the uh, fighting as such. Uh, because I'm just assuming that these were a bunch of people who had been living as slaves for at least 300 years. And so they would not exactly have learned any soldier skills. So they would have probably had to train for it. Because, you know, suddenly the enemy comes one day and they're not when uh, trained, they probably wouldn't know which, you know, which end of the knife to hold. So they would need some training. So it would take a lot of time and effort to train up the army. And so the Levites were not given those duties because they had a greater job. They were the ones who would show the Israelites, keep your eyes on the Lord. Chariots can help to an extent. Horses can help to an extent, but ultimately your faith should be in the Lord. So their duty, the Levites would not be you know, in, involved in all this training and equipping themselves for battle and all of that. They would stay focused on honoring the Lord and exalting him because no point in having a really powerful army, that army is uh, not looking to the Lord. Finally, the victory comes from him. So the priests were set aside and they were meant to only represent God even in the battlefield. And we see this especially in the battle which takes place against the Midianites. That would be Numbers chapter 31, verses 1 to 6, where the Lord says to Moses, take vengeance on the Midianites for the Israelites. Why did God want to take vengeance on the Midianites? Because the Midianites are the people who led the people into sexual immorality so that they would no longer be under the protection of God so that uh, you know the protection of God would be removed from them so the the it's it's these Midianite people who tempt God's people away from following the Lord so the Lord says because of the strategy which they came up with to lead the people away from God therefore they must be punished for what they have done and so the Lord says take vengeance against the Midianites, and uh, then we see uh, in um, you know in, in that passage verses one to six that Phinehas, son of Eleazar, so he is the priest. He also goes into the battlefield, and he is now going over there not to fight in the battle, but as the instrument through whom the judgment of God is going to come down upon these Midianites. Okay, so uh, the the priests would go over there as representatives of God's strength, 
they would go over there as representatives of god's judgment and god's victory okay so they would uh, continue to pay, play a spiritual role even in the battlefield so that should you know make us think a little bit about our role even as we sit over here in the classroom we are all supposed to be a kingdom of priests so we have a priestly role of honoring him exalting him uh, and you know fulfilling his purposes in our lives but at the same time uh, we are also uh, soldiers because we are involved in a spiritual warfare and when is the spiritual warfare successful only when your priestly role is coming first you see you're exalting him and you're uh, sharing about him with others so that they too may know him and exalt him that is your primary goal and when you are operating from that position then your spiritual warfare will be successful because when you exalt the lord in your life he exalts himself in your situations so uh, we see that coming across you know in this uh, through this uh, you know passage in the book of numbers yeah uh, coming to the to another point regarding these levites okay uh, we still have time okay um yeah god talks about how he is going to set aside the levites for himself and we see an explanation for that in numbers chapter 3 verses 11 to 13 where god says maybe someone can read it out numbers chapter 3 verses 11 to 13 okay so over here it says in this passage when i passed over in the land of egypt i passed over your houses i did not touch your first born because you placed your faith in me and you put you know the blood of the sacrifice lamb on your door posts because of the faith with you, which you put in me i did not touch your first born all of your first born were safe even your animals the first born of all your animals were not touched they were not killed when i passed over in in uh, egypt therefore all of these first born of the animals as well as the humans they are now mine through this um, you know act of deliverance which i did for you i have now reserved them for myself so the first born of every single family would automatically be considered as dedicated unto god which means he would not be able to continue with normal everyday routines you know like going and doing his farming and all of that because most of his time will be occupied in taking care of the religious duties and the maintenance of the tabernacle and all of that so it would become a problem throughout the land if all of the first borns in from all of the families and tribes start doing that it kind of affects their uh, you know everyday functioning so the lord says instead of taking the first born from each home and from each tribe i will do something different i will just reserve one single tribe and they will be a representation of all the first born of all the families so they can devote themselves completely to the spiritual duties and that would leave all the other families free to continue with the you know other responsibilities of life which need to be undertaken and that is why god decides to reserve one tribe and so that they will become a representation of uh, the first born uh, everywhere now but when it comes to animals what about the first born of each uh, you know a uh, uh, bunch of animals that each family owns so those are also reserved for him so they cannot just continue using those animals for other purposes they would have to be sacrificed uh to the lord because these first born animals belong to him okay so those are all, uh, those are all things which are mentioned in um exodus 30 uh, you know exodus 11 4 to 5 talks about that um exodus 13 13 to 16 also talks about that so god reserves for himself the first born of the humans as well as the first born of the animals um okay we still have time uh we could maybe very briefly look at the rebellion of korah that's one of the very uh, major events which takes place 
uh, in the book of Numbers. Um, Korah too is tempted. I think maybe in this uh, book of Numbers, this is around the time where Moses has finally been, you know, reached his height. In the beginning, nobody was even respecting him. They were not even speaking to him properly. They were not really accepting his leadership. But now he has risen up in their eyes because God is fully backing him up. So now they respect him as a leader. And now he is famous. Now he is popular. And now suddenly everyone wants to be like him. So which is why you have that rebellion of Aaron and Miriam, where they also want to be recognized the way he is being recognized. And over here, you have Korah you know, having a similar temptation. Um, so he says that he wants to be one of the priests. Uh, uh, we were very clearly told that Aaron and his sons would be priests. But over here, he says, um, we are, okay, this would be Numbers chapter 16, all right? So you could maybe look into Numbers chapter 16 and uh, maybe verse 10, where it very specifically says, um, you know, Korah has brought you and all of your fellow Levites near himself, but now you are trying to get the... Yeah, it is actually verse, um, verses 8, 9, 10, talk about how um, Korah wants the priesthood for himself. And then the Lord uh, says that, okay, those of you who are saying that you also want to be priests, come and stand before the Lord, and the Lord will decide whether you deserve to be priests or not. So they all fill up their censers with burning coals and incense, and they come and stand before the entrance and then we know God's judgment comes down upon them so that would be verses 31 32 and on um, where the um, it says in verse 35 fire from God comes out and swallows up the 250 men who were standing there they thought that they were wonderful candidates for priesthood and so they believed that they should be made equal to Aaron and his sons but it's not what God had instructed. They were openly, openly rebelling against what God had appointed and assigned. And so fire from God comes down and consumes those 250 men. And then worse than that, the ground opens up and they and all their households are swallowed up by this um, earthquake of judgment which comes from the Lord. And then after seeing something like this with their eyes, the people should have been at least afraid by now. But the people are like such wonderful grumblers. They start grumbling again. I mean, imagine if something like that has happened in front of their eyes. They saw an entire family, you know, the earth opening up and being, you know, the entire thing, uh, family being swallowed up. They've seen all of that. And what is their response? They start grumbling and they say, um, you have killed the Lord's people. Did Moses and Aaron do any killing? All they were doing is standing over there and, you know, seeing what is happening. It's the Lord who did it. But now they are grumbling against Moses and Aaron. That's in verse 41. And they're saying, you have killed the Lord's people. Then God is really angry that even now after seeing his judgment, there is no sign of fear or respect towards him. And so the, there's a plague which starts. People start dying. Literally, people start dying throughout the camp. And then Moses and Aaron, you know, the two people who are getting grumbled at, who are being complained against, they are the ones immediately Moses says to Aaron, quickly rush. You know, the word over there used is hurry, hurry to the assembly to make atonement for them. They could have stood back and said, ah, good. They were, you know, just now they were complaining against us and criticizing us. Now they're dying. Good, let them die. No, that's not the attitude. You, you literally see the heart of Moses and the heart of Aaron. They quickly rush to take up the, you know, the, the sacrifice which is needed to make atonement. And um, it says over here, take the incense, yeah, take your censer and put incense in it and hurry to the assembly to make atonement for them. So um, Aaron takes up the censer and he goes rushing in. And uh, by that time already, uh, 14,700 people uh, get killed. But then the rest of them survive because of the atonement which Aaron makes for the people in his role as high priest. So God would have looked at him rushing over there with a censer and he would have remembered in his mind, oh, he is a representation of what Jesus Christ, my son, will do one day. So I will accept it. I will allow this atonement you know, to be acceptable to me. And so he spares the people. 
Um, so yeah, we see all of these things happening in the book of numbers. Uh, yeah, any uh, questions that you have? Yes, we have a question here. Okay. Hmm. We, uh, yeah, just for those of us who are online, uh, the question here is basically from the book of Joshua when you should be, uh, when they actually start, uh, you know, going out into battle. But yeah, the basic question was that. Uh, if God said that thou shalt not murder, then why is it that God asks them to fight against the people of Canaan and uh, why all of those battles take place? Uh, probably it's not a question which I should answer now because you know it's a thing that would be dealt with in the book of Joshua. But just for us, because I, right now I do not have the Bible references with me, but just to give a basic answer uh, right now, um, the Lord had told them even before they came out of Egypt, uh, he says that, well, he says it to Abraham. And like I said, I don't have the scripture references right now. I will have them when we know when we have that class. He, God says that he will use the uh, Israelites as his instrument to bring judgment upon the people of Canaan when the time comes. So God gives them hundreds of years to change their ways. Uh, and you know to uh, accept him but they do not give up their evil ways so finally when the time for judgment comes at that time the israelites are sent into the land as god's instrument of judgment so they are not acting on their own it is divine judgment which is being released by god on the people and in fact when we are covering the book of joshua we will see this interesting incident i'm pretty sure it was joshua yeah where they go and attack one particular people group that God had not mentioned. When he mentions ju judgment which would come upon Canaan, there are specifically seven nations that God has in mind. The time for judging those seven nations has come. And so God backs up every single battle which is fought against those seven nations. But then there's a group of people which is talked about who are not mentioned in God's list. And there are some Israelites who actually go and attack them. And the Lord is not at all pleased. The Lord is very displeased with what they have done. So these are not just acts of um, uh, selfish warfare. These are actually acts of divine judgment, which God had planned a long, long time. And now when the time was right, it came upon the people. So we would uh, not consider it murder for the simple reason God had decided the time for punishment had come. But then again, we cannot say that God was harsh and you know ruthless because God gave them that many years to change themselves, but they had no sense of repentance. And that is why finally, after waiting so long, the Lord judges them. Uh, so yes, uh, any other questions? Oh yeah, oh, yes, yeah. So the question which has been asked over here is from Numbers chapter 12, where um, Moses and Aaron, actually Aaron and Miriam are uh, rising up against Moses, uh, partially, of course, because you know they feel that they should also be given an equal importance and authority, and also partially because they're very, very unhappy with the person whom he has married. Um, so um, we do know that when Moses first goes into the you know uh, wilderness to run away from the Egyptian soldiers, at that time he settles down, and the, at that time he does marry uh, uh, Jethro's daughter. So we are aware of that uh, marriage. Uh, now we don't know whether it's the same lady that is being talked about over here, or whether he marries someone else. Um, you know, after that, uh, but 
they do not like her because uh, she is of a uh, mixed race. She's of a different race. Uh, not mixed race. She's in, in fact belongs to a different race. Her skin color is different. She's darker uh, than the than these people, the Israelites, and they do not like her because of that. And uh, so um, it probably would have started with that, you know, a, a practical lesson that we can learn from life. You know, it started. It starts off with small uh, irritations, discontentment, disagreements. They don't like the lady that she has married. They feel that, oh my, why did you go and marry someone inferior? She's dark skinned. She doesn't belong to our culture. So it would have started off with those things. And then slowly they would have started thinking, ah, what is so great about him? We are also great. We are also leading. We are also putting up with the people's grumbling every day. So why should he get special position? So it advances that way. So yes, it is true that they were unhappy with uh, his uh, wife. Uh, and it, and most of the scholars say it's because she belonged to a different race, and uh, they probably felt that she's inferior to them. Um, yeah. Anything else that we can? Uh, you know, it says here that someone has raised a hand, but then for that, I would need to again meddle with those, um, you know, sound uh, things, and I dare not do that. Uh, so if you could, if it's a short question, and you can type it over there. Uh, I can look at it, or otherwise put it in the stream page. Okay, all the questions of students online, you can put your questions in the stream page, and I will answer those questions next class. Okay, so before we would get into uh, Deuteronomy, yeah. before we would get into Deuteronomy, we will address all of those questions. So uh, if if it is possible, uh, you can uh, you know type your question out right now. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can put it in the stream page. And uh, I'll address all of the questions which are mentioned in the stream page in the next class. There was a question from here. Yes. Ah. Mm. Yeah. Let's actually go to it because I don't have it in my. Uh, where is my numbers? Chapter twelve. Okay, let's get rid of this. Um, yeah. Where does it uh, talk about the? Okay, yeah. The in, in verse one, beginning. Okay, in the beginning. Uh, while they were at Hazaroth, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had indeed married a Cushite uh, woman. And then, of course, they starts off, you know, uh, talking about how um, they also want to be, uh, you know, con considered as important as Moses. So then we come down to verse um, eight where God is angry and God is saying, uh, why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. And then in verse 10 is where uh, the leprosy comes upon Miriam. So the question that was asked here in the class is that, uh, why is it that only Miriam gets the leprosy and not Aaron as well? Um, we will look at verses 11 and 12. Then Aaron said to Moses, Oh, my Lord, do not punish us for a sin that we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like one stillborn whose flesh is half consumed. Um, and then, of course, the Lord, Moses intercedes okay, for her. And um, so over here, Aaron says that, you know, you, the punishment has come upon us. And even God says his anger was kindled against them. So it was. Um, it was Miriam who got the leprosy, but the pain of it, the judgment of it was also fully experienced by Aaron. Uh, but this is a pure assumption, okay? I mean, there's nothing which I have read in any commentary, but I'm assuming that uh, the leprosy came upon her specifically because obviously she's the one who probably would have started the instigations against the Kushite wife, you know? Women 
all uh, in a separate tent. I mean, that's basically how they lived, right? They, had, they would have three, four tents and uh, they would all live in different tents. So uh, there would have been a clash between the women. Kushite lady trying to bring her Kushite customs into our uh, home. What is this? Is probably would have been how the whole thing started off. So Miriam would have disapproved. And then Aaron would have joined in and said, yeah, true, he should not have done that. And then they forget that this is an anointed man that they are talking about, and they better be careful. So that is where, uh, so this is just my assumption. I'm assuming that God is always very fair about how he judges. He only judges to the extent of the uh, act of sin that was done. So I'm assuming that maybe uh, she had a greater role because she probably would have first started the instigations. Okay, so that's just my assumption. Um, yes. I, um, yeah, Nina, I think, was unable to post, but that's totally fine because, Nina, when you go ahead and, you know, post your question in the stream, I will definitely address it next class. All right, so I'll, I'll be able to look at it and address it. So uh, we are actually out of time, so we will now finish. Um, if, um, oh, there was one more question. No, there. Right? Okay. There is a question. But we are out of time, and we have heard the bell from above. So, um, so I can maybe just address it after the class. All right, yes. Um, let's just close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for today's class. Thank you, Lord, for some of the things that we could learn from the book of Numbers. Um, Lord, you're a God who uh, loves to raise up your people, redeem your people, uh, bless them. So that is why you prepared these people to enter into your wonderful promised land with great love, with great care. You trained them and you uh, were ready to send them in. But then they chose not to trust you. And so we see a lot of judgments coming down in the book of Numbers because, Lord, they chose not to trust you. They chose to, um, to, to be light against you by you know, not taking you seriously and not obeying you. They disregarded you. And we see a judgments coming upon them because of this. Today, even as we are living sealed with the Holy Spirit, I pray, O oh Lord, that we would not stoop down to their level. Help us, O oh Lord, to honor you, to have this awareness that you who are so great is actually living in us. So help us, O oh Lord, to really uh, live in a way that uh, brings you honor. And Lord, we pray that um, we would learn from these uh, lessons which we can get out of this book of numbers from the stories of the people over there. Help us a lot to follow a better example. Help us a lot to be better people, uh, to be like Moses and Aaron rather than like the uh, people of Israel who grumbled and were ungrateful. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would change us and mold us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you so much and we will uh, meet again next week. <laughs>